Good morning to the greatest group of people in Mississippi. It is a joy to be here on this beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning that follows up a fantastic few days the Lord's blessed us with, as Ronnie mentioned before. Uh, I love the book of Deuteronomy. Because as Deuteronomy closes out all of that, that Pentateuch, those rules and laws and regulations, it's almost as if in the book of Leviticus and in the book of Numbers, God has been telling them the what and the how. This is what you've got to do, and this is exactly, precisely how you have to do it. But then we get to Deuteronomy, and it's still got some these and thous and do's and don'ts, and a prescription for exactly how, but Deuteronomy's different. Because it's almost as if now these children have grown up. They're the children of Israel. And when my little children were small, before they had a full understanding, it was just all about do's and don'ts. Anybody raising little kids? I see a bunch of them out here. Man, there's a lot of do's and don'ts. Well, I saw one little kid actually raise his hand. You met mama's raising you, right? Okay, so it, the do's and the don'ts. I mean, that's what you got to do. They don't understand why they can't run in the direction of the street. But they know that they're going to get whopped if they do. But you as their parent, you understand that. But as they get older, the do's and the don'ts are given context. Isn't that right? I mean, I had a different conversation with my kids as teenagers than I did when they were toddlers. Because all they could understand in the beginning was the do's and the don'ts. The these and the thou's. But as they got older, I began to tell them not just the what, not just the how, but the all-important why. And Deuteronomy is a why book. It goes, and yes, it's in the context of that old law of Moses, but it shows why God wants these things, and it shows what God's real heart is and his desire for true relationship with the children of Israel. And our text today in Deuteronomy 8, and we're also going to look extensively at the end of our lesson at Deuteronomy 10, maybe may, may my second favorite section in the Old Testament. And we're going to look at the question of God's initiative, particularly in regard to justification, which simply means to make us right, to make us justified. And if, when we talk about the word initiative, it basically means to begin, to start something, to get the ball rolling. Every occasion in life, every circumstance, anything that is ever accomplished, somebody at some point took the initiative. They got it started. They got the ball rolling. Every one of you who built a business from the ground up, somebody took the initiative. Somebody had a dream and worked on that dream, and implemented that dream, and put all the pieces together to make it happen, and the end result, whatever that business is, or however big it grew, is all rooted in that dream, and that person who took those first steps, who took the initiative. And when we think about the idea of initiative, and the fact that every great thing that's ever happened in the history of the world had its seed had its beginning in someone's initiative. What about when it comes to the greatest story ever told? The true why of existence, the justification of man and the reunification of man, sinful mankind with God. Who had the initiative? You know, it's important that we consider this because the opposite of initiative is something that maybe we don't use the word, but we understand the concept, inertia. Initiative and inertia. Inertia is the idea that a body at rest tends to remain at rest, that principle of physics, right? It's harder to get something moving than to keep it moving. You ever noticed that before? Just, just realize next time you're stuck in the mud, you're trying to pull, somebody's trying to pull you out. Once they get those wheels finally up out of the mud hole and, and on dry 
dry ground or at least firmer ground, boy, it's a whole lot easier than just getting it going to begin with. You see, that's the way inertia is. Well, initiative is the opposite. It is movement in essence. It is kind of taking that inertia, but pushing it forward, getting it moving. And when we look at passages like Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 4, I absolutely love, and I, I, I know we study this verse, but I've always wondered why it's not one of our go-to memorization verses, because it is so glorious. Because it says in verse 3 of Titus chapter 3, for we ourselves were also once foolish. We were disobedient, we were deceived, we were serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and living in envy, hateful and hating one another. Now that is not a complimentary list, and it's not addressed to people who are, you know, out there somewhere, the strange others that we don't personally know. In fact, he says, we, for we ourselves were once these things. But then verse 4, but when the kindness, when the kindness and the love, when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. You see, that verse is a verse that's all about initiative. He says we were foolish. We were in malice. We were in lust. We were in envy. We were living in these foolish ways. He says, but then the love of and the kindness of our God, and here's the word he uses, appeared. It's almost as if out of nowhere, completely unexpected, the kindness and the love of God appeared. And then he goes on and he says, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So he says, it's nothing we've done, nothing we've accomplished. Nothing we've earned. He says, he did it all. And that is the very essence of initiative. You see, we are not saved. And this is so important for us to wrap our minds around. Because, and I think it was from a pure motive where we got arrived at this point, a desire to obey. But somehow, if we're not careful, that desire to obey the need to be obedient to God's commands can supersede the why we need to be obedient to God's commands. And we can come to a point like the Pharisees did where they think that somehow their salvation is tied to or connected in some way with what they do. And this verse and literally dozens and dozens of passages in the New Testament are emphatically clear. He did it. He started it. And he didn't just get the ball rolling. He kept the ball rolling. And he didn't just keep the ball rolling. He's continuing to keep the ball rolling. And if we live a hundred years on this earth, that'll be a hundred years in our life in regard to our salvation, that he's going to be at the wheel of the ball that's rolling. All we do is ride the ball. Now, that doesn't mean we don't emphasize obedience. That doesn't mean we can ignore and live in rebellion. No, obedience in our text today is going to be emphatically clear about it. It's essential. Obedience is crucial to this whole thing. But what it isn't is that which we do to somehow contribute to our salvation. And that's Probably is the best way to put it. We are obedient because he did it all. We are not obedient to help him out with it. To contribute to it. Because our, what does it say in the New Testament? Our righteousness is as filthy rags. Filthy rags. And 
we turn in our text back to Deuteronomy chapter 8, 1 and 2, the reason I love this passage so much, and I, I, I've actually spiritually built everything that I try to be and everything I encourage my children and our family to be around the concepts of this text, because I believe this text is what everybody's looking for in this world, philosophically. And that is the meaning of life. What is life all about? Why are we here? Where are we going? What's it all about? What's it mean? Well, in this text, it says every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to obey and observe. See, we're not dismissing the need for obedience. Right there, he says, you must be careful to obey and observe. That you may live and multiply and go into possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. The reason this verse is still as imperative to us as it was then is the same reason that when we read about the lamb that has had his pure blood spread over their doorpost and therefore death passed over them as it struck the Egyptians. Or when we read about the temple and how God's presence dwelt in the Holy of Holies and the curtain separated God from man. And then when Jesus died, that curtain was torn in two, showing us that that curtain wasn't just about a curtain. It was representative. It was a shadow of the reality of sin that separated God and man before Jesus. You see, everything in the Old Testament has a double meaning. It has the meaning historically, the one that is happening in the context of the people who lived at that time. But it also points to the realities in Christ Jesus in this great spiritual age of faith in which we live. And this verse is talking about the promised land and the wilderness. And the promised land, we sing to Canaan's land, I'm on my way. And we're not going to Jerusalem. We're going to the new Jerusalem. You see, we understand that the promised land was a shadow of heaven. That's where we're going. But if heaven is the reality of the promised land, then that means that which they has to pass through to get to the promised land is also a shadow of a reality. You see, they have to go through this place of hardship, pain, suffering, heat, stress, sickness, and death to get to the promised land. And that place was called the wilderness. So if heaven is the reality of the physical promised land, then what would be the reality of the physical place of suffering and trial and trouble they had to pass through to get to the promised land? You see, when it says wilderness, it means life. This verse is about life. So he says here, why did I allow you to wander these 40 years in the wilderness? And for us, it means very plainly. Why did I allow you to live these however many years that you're going to live in this world of hardship and suffering and pain and death? Why? This is the why. Why are we alive? And he tells us to humble you and to test you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. You know, I think sometimes we get caught up and we overreact to those in the religious world that maybe don't have the whole picture or don't teach the whole gospel. Because they use certain phrases or certain ideas, we swing too far the other way and just avoid those like the plague. A good example would be once saved, barely saved as a response to once saved, always saved. Or just let's just not ever talk about the Holy Spirit because people mistake what that all means. I mean, we do. Can we admit that? We do tend to swing the opposite way. Well, I think maybe we do that on occasion with this idea of the heart. Because we hear doctrinally 
inappropriate and incorrect, I mean, false views of the heart where people say you just need to take Jesus into your heart. I mean, what they're meaning by that is just say you're sorry and believe in Christ and there's nothing else involved in salvation. And that's abundantly not true. I mean, we have to engage with what the Bible calls real faith which involves hearing the gospel and believing it with all of our hearts and changing our life. And then, of course, submitting ourselves utterly to die to ourselves and to become his forever, which takes place in that watery grave of baptism. So what people are meaning by just, just you know, take him into your heart, or maybe when they just say you just need to listen, or just give him your heart, that's enough. We sometimes will react the other way, and emphasize obedience, obedience, obedience. But here's the thing we miss from this passage. You cannot separate the heart and obedience. Because obedience is that which tells God about our heart. That's what it says. Why did I allow you to wander in the wilderness these 40 years? To test you. To know what is in your heart whether you obey my commandments or not. You see, commandments and our obedience to them are a means to an end for God because they tell him where our heart is. So yes, obedience is vitally important because our heart is vitally important. It's what God wants out of all this. God does not just want robotic obeyers. If he did, Jesus and the Pharisees would have got along really well. Now Jesus says, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. You see, God wants your obedience because God wants your heart. Because God wants you to love him. God wants you to choose him. And if there's no obedience to it, it's just words. You know, you may, we've all seen this circumstance, two young people in love and you say to your teenage daughter, well, well, you say you know you love him. How do you know? Well, he loves me so much, Daddy. He just tells me all the time he loves me, he loves me. But then, as a parent, if you see things you observe that don't reflect the things that young man says, you're going to go to her and say, I don't care how much he says he loves you, he sure doesn't act like he loves you. Isn't that right? Jesus said you honor me with your lips. But your heart is far, far from me. And what he's telling us there is he wants more than us just saying the right things. He wants more than us just doing the right things. The thing is, is that you can never curse. You can come to church. You can pay your taxes. You can give to the poor and be utterly unpleasing to God. Now, he wants you to do all those things. But he wants you to do them for the right reason. Because it's in your heart. That's why, he, why does it say in the New Testament, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. You may be the hardest worker at your job, but it means nothing to God if you don't do it for him. You may attend every time the doors are open your entire life and get a perfect merit badge of church attendance. But if you're not doing it because you want to be there with him and you love him, what does it doesn't matter? And yes, in the beginning, we start off with the carrot and the stick. You know, yeah, if I don't go, I might not make it to heaven or if I do go I'll get whatever heaven or whatever other blessings God I mean everybody starts off with the carrot and the stick but when a two year old 
is all about not getting a whooping or getting a piece of candy. That's one thing. But when they're 20, their motivations for doing right better have changed. And when a brand new person comes up out of the water, they've got to work out all those motivations. But if we've been sitting in the pew for 40 years, we should have moved beyond just doing things so we get to go to heaven and not go to hell. It needs to be about our love, our heart for God. Because you see, when your heart is with God, I, I want to obey him. It's not that I live in fear of what's going to happen to me if I don't. Or, ooh, what kind of reward am I going to get if I do? The greatest reward that God wants you to long for is his good pleasure. What God wants. He took the initiative. You see, what God knew was that sin would overtake us. In Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, it cannot save, or his ear heavy, it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. Because of God's justice, he can't be around sin, so he had to find a way. And God's initiative found a way. God's initiative was manifested in the scheme of redemption. I love that we call it the scheme of redemption. Because to me, a scheme sounds sneaky. You know, you never notice that we never use that word in a positive light, except in the phrase, the scheme of redemption. If somebody comes to you with a business proposition and says, hey, man, I want to tell you about the best scheme you've ever heard. You're like, right? Uh, you know, if somebody, if you're in school and somebody says, hey, listen, I got a great scheme for us to do good on the test. No. Isn't that weird? Because scheme usually means a little bit underhanded, right? But we call it the scheme of redemption. You know why that is? Because that's exactly what God did. But the only person he cheated was his own justice. He found a way to satisfy the technicality that he had to punish sin. But yet save the sinner. You and I have been saved by the greatest cosmic loophole in the history of the universe. Because God found a scheme. He found a way to both satisfy his justice, what he had to do, but still give him what he wanted, which is the heart of people who were sinners, but he wanted to be reunited with. Sin is universally terminal disease that God sought to cure. It tells us in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But God's method, as his initiative was manifested in that scheme of redemption, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for God made him who had no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And the result is God's initiative brought about justification. You see, what he did is he exchanged Christ's wages for ours. The wages of sin is death. Then what would the wages of no sin be? Life. So in essence, he exchanged those wages. But of course, we still have to cash the check. It's always been amazing to me that people come up with the idea that when we respond to the gospel, that somehow that's a work. And that we're insinuating that we're saved by our works. No, no, no. If somebody gives you a hundred million dollars and you go to the bank and deposit the check and you endorse it, you sign it on the back, you earn that hundred million dollars, right? By signing the check. That's absurdity. But yet people say that well, because the scriptures say that you must respond and you must, in order to, to be a part of Christ, you believe in him, you confess his name, you're baptized into Christ. Well, that's just teaching works. 
it, like standing there and just falling back into the water deserves the riches of eternity. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I want you to be my boss. Because I'm going to have some good negotiation days when it comes to salary time, right? It's ridiculous. Signing the check doesn't mean you earned it. Responding to his magnificent grace and ever insinuating that there's anything we could do that could even, in its most minute way, contribute to our salvation is an insult to his magnificent justification and grace. So when we think about this text in Deuteronomy 8, I'd like to close with Deuteronomy chapter 10. Verses 12 through 17. It says something very similar, but has some slight nuances that are different than chapter 8. And now Israel, what does the Lord God require of you but to fear the Lord your God? To walk in all of his ways, and here's, here's the key, and to love him. To serve the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all of your soul. And to keep his commandments. Of the Lord and the statutes which I command you today for your good. For indeed heaven. And the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God. Also the earth and all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers. To love them. And he chose their descendants after them. You above all peoples. As it is this day. Therefore. Circumcise the foreskin of your heart. And be stiff necked no longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods. And Lord of lords. The great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality, nor takes a bribe. I love that last part, nor takes a bribe. You see, God can't be swayed by anything other than the one thing he wants. That means it doesn't matter how much money we have. It doesn't matter how much works we do. It doesn't matter how righteous we may appear. God doesn't take a bribe. He only wants one thing. And he laid that out. Love the Lord your God. Love him with all of your heart. Love him with your soul. And if you do that, the evidence of it, the demonstration is you will keep his commandments. You see, God loved us so much that he, he took the initiative. He did that. He started it all. He initiated our salvation, followed it through, paid for it himself, suffered and died. If there's anyone here today, if you don't have a real relationship with the Lord, then your life cannot be fulfilled. It is the reason for living, the meaning of life. If you need to come to Christ, or perhaps you've come to Christ and you just forget sometimes what matters the most. Whatever it is you need, we're here, we want to pray with you. If you'll come right now as we stand and as we sing.